Hello, May. Hello, Christopher. Good afternoon. How are you? I'm pretty good. Um, Chris, will I be sharing the slides? Okay. And I'm going to do a quick test. Um, when I, we're going to see the borders of PowerPoint at this point, I don't care because to open, I would otherwise have to open three different screens to make it look pretty. All right. Are you seeing the Sherm stuff here? Yes, ma'am. All right. And it's visible enough? Yep. Okay. We'll leave it on there. And you will speak to the Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Sorry about my computer. I don't know. I, I got an IT ticket out to see if I can get Zoom on our. So our list. when I clicked on the link, my company blocked the link for whatever reason, but I could join it using the meeting ID. Did you try that? I got, I got all kinds of warnings of infection and spam and yeah, went through it really three times. And really not didn't with, follow the link. Yeah, Zoom is not. We'll talk to about it as a as a board, I think. But moving into next year, I think we need to figure something uh, a better tool out because I know that they exist, and I know Zoom used to be the thing. But I don't know. We'll discuss it. But it could just be our account. I don't know. We'll figure. It could, it. I don't know. It's like it's doctor, our main speaker is here. Yeah, well, most here, just waiting for time to start, so. Well, you'll have to teach me how to say your name so I don't butcher it. Dr. Glove, yeah, Dr. Glove is fine. Dr. Glove, okay, yes. nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. What's the Anchorage weather like, friends? Mid 40s. Hmm. But beautiful and clear. It is. It is a beautiful, clear day. But it uh, sounds like Fairbanks got their first snow today. I think it was yesterday. I was talking to oh, someone. Yeah. She said it snowed all day. Yeah. Where are you at? In 90 degree humid and lots of mosquito infested Dallas area. All right. All right. <laughs> appreciate you trying to make that sound bad. <laughs> it's a little too hot. Uh, <laughs> Kind of miss home with uh, weather like this. Yeah, someone's calling me about the link not working. Yeah, that was Patty trying to call. I found if I just went into my Zoom and entered the, you know, the two pieces, the uh, meeting number and then the passcode carefully because the passcode wants to copy with a invisible final digit uh, that I was able to get in. She's saying having the same issues that we were looking at May where uh, she wasn't able to even see uh, within our Zoom account that we had uh, a meeting set for today. Forgot what we did to actually get that on there but she wasn't able to to see that let's let me forward her that she is trying to get on that's fine so good afternoon everyone we're gonna give it one more minute we have 15 participants, but we had over 30 register. So we'll just give it a couple more minutes, just one more minute until we get started. And Chris here will kick off. So, as you know, I'm professor at Ohio State. 
What's that? All right, Chris, we're ready for you. All right, we will get this kicked off. And I think Patty was still trying to log on, but she'll figure it out. I did forward her that invite. So it looks like we have 16 participants and we will get to our speaker here very, very shortly. But first, a uh, quick, um, quick shout out here, um, board of directors for this year. Uh, thank you for everybody who had volunteered for it. We are looking for a diversity chair. So this isn't an electable role. This is something that we look for outside of uh, or within our membership. So if you, you or no, uh, if you know somebody that may be interested in joining the board as a diversity chair, then definitely let myself, Patty, um, um, or really anybody on the board know. Um, so next slide. If you were at actually last week, right? We had our luncheon last month, last week. So um, this is a friendly reminder that if you have not registered for our networking event on the 12th, which is in uh, less than 10 days. Do that now. We're celebrating our, our 49th uh, year as a chapter. And I know I'm going to be there. May's going to be there. Um, get in there, register, lots of free stuff, gifts, and it's going to be a blast. Um, and another reminder uh, for those uh, that have signed up for uh, the cert certification or want to sign up for the prep classes, they're coming up. Um, they're starting this month. Uh, mid-month, October 16th, um, and there's a number of sessions. Um, you can go onto our website to register for those uh, certification prep courses, um, and if you have any questions, then you can reach out to, to us or the uh, certification board member. You should have all received an email on Thursday last week, maybe Friday. Uh, our board elections are up and live. Last I looked, I looked this morning. Um, I think we had about 55 votes in there out of about 500 members. So uh, if you have not voted, uh, please get in there, get into your, check your spam inbox, whatever uh, you need to do to, uh, to see it. If you did not receive a ballot, reach out to me. Uh, you can find my, my email address on our website and, uh, and I'll get you a ballot. I can get in there and kind of manually put it in if you haven't received them or if your email's changed, uh, if it's different than the one that you have registered uh, with SHRM. Um, I'm going to pass this one on to Mary since I think this is kind of more uh, her thing. Mary, are you there? I am. Okay, do you want to talk to this slide real quick? Absolutely. I hope that you all have signed up to join us to hear Dr. Dr. Charla Brown on Monday the 16th, if I recall that date correctly. She was working in HR at Enron at the time that Enron collapsed. And she has an, an amazing presentation from Feet on the Street and what it was like and the ethical dilemma. So that will be live as well as by Zoom, I want to encourage you to come in person. First of all, it's much easier to see and talk to her and have a little bit more of interplay. And second of all, we're in a situation where we cannot always guarantee really good connectivity for our Zoom meetings. So please go to the website for our chapter, for the ASHRM, and register there. I'd hope to see you in person and uh, you know, if you can't, well, I'd rather see you on Zoom, but not at all. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Mary. Um, and then before we kick this off, I think this is the last one. Does anybody have any announcement they would like to make? Are you looking for a job? Are you hiring? Um, so this is a, a chance for, for anyone to speak up if they're looking for something. I'll take my chance and speak up. Go, um, go. ANTHC is looking for an HR business partner. So if you are interested or if you know someone, please direct them to myself or to our website, uh, which is anthc.org. And yeah, we're looking for a business partner for a phenomenal team of seven. And we have an added uh, position. So yeah, feel free to touch base. Thanks, May. Anybody else? Speak now. Let's see that Tom just joined. Tom, do you do you have any uh, announcements? Any hire? Uh, looking for anybody? Um, they're they're over uh, where you're at. Call them out for being late. 
Sorry, Tom. All right, let's move on to the next one. Okay, so I think we're ready to introduce our speaker today. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. My name is Mae Main and I'm the program's chair. And this month we have Dr. Gleb joining us. Um, and the topic is the blind spots between us, how to overcome unconscious cognitive bias and build better relationships. Uh, I'd like to do a brief introduction. Um, the email invite had a lot of details, but in this engaging, interactive and entertaining presentation, you as an HR professional will dramatically improve your skills in addressing unconscious bias and mental blind spots in yourself and in others in your team and organization to build better professional um, relationships. And there is some research in cognitive neuroscience and behavioral economics that show um, from subtle and unconscious dangerous judgment errors called cognitive biases. So we can't wait to dive in, but a little more about Dr. Gleb. He helps HR professionals address these biases and improve workplace culture and connection in hybrid and office-centric settings. He serves as the CEO of the boutique Future of Work Consultancy, disaster avoidance expert, and he is a best-selling author of seven books. He is especially well-known for his global bestseller, Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions and Avoid Business Disasters. The list goes on and on, but you all have access to it. And um, we we'll give you a warm welcome, welcome from way up north in crispy, cold Alaska today. <laughs> Thank you. Although some of you are in Dallas, which is nice and hot from what I hear. <laughs> all right, everyone. Welcome. So let's talk about unconscious cognitive bias building with relationships. Hopefully my presentation will inspire at least one of you to apply for the empty diversity chair. So make, so think about that. And that should hopefully be something that is going to be on your mind. Let's talk about the shape of the presentation, just to let you know what's coming up. First, we'll be talking about the ways that we make mistakes in our relationship to others, the blind spots between us. So it's based on my best-selling book of the same name, The Blind Spots Between Us, How to Overcome Unconscious Cognitive Bias and Build Better Relationships. And you will have an opportunity to get a chance to get a copy of that book. So not selling the book, you'll have an opportunity to get for free at the end of the presentation if you want it. Now, so you'll, we'll talk about those blind spots, we'll talk about the mistakes, and then we'll talk about some ways of addressing those mistakes. So that's gonna be the shape of the presentation. That's what you can anticipate. Now. Let's talk about how we make decisions. And the first thing I want to talk about is confidence, is being confident. Now, you've probably heard that you really need to be confident in your relationships to others. When you think about others, when you interact with them, but also in other settings. I mean, imagine you're driving and you're merging onto the highway. It's important to be confident when you're doing that, not to slow down, but to speed up. Or when you're changing lanes, it's important to be confident to, to speed up, not slow down. So think about yourself. Are you a below average driver or an above average driver? Let's take a poll and see whether we are in the top half, you're in the top half or bottom half of all drivers. Are you above average or below average? So please go ahead and vote. Top half or bottom half of all drivers. Five more seconds, make your voice heard. Okay, so we see that 75% of us are in the top half of all drivers and only 25% are in the bottom half of all drivers. Now, does that really make sense? That really should not be the case. We should have a 50-50 split. 50% of us should be in the top half and 50% of us should be in the bottom half. But that's not how our mind works. We feel confident about our driving and we feel somewhat 
overconfident. So there's an overconfidence bias within us. When we make judgments about our driving skills, about our ability to have relationships with others in all life areas, we have a tendency to be too confident on average. So we see that from the overconfidence bias example. When people say they're 100% confident, they're only right 80% of the time on average. So no wonder that Las Vegas makes so much money that uh, people make mistakes when they make bets, when you bet the house, bet the farm, and you're only going to be right 80% of the time on average. This is a big problem. It's especially dangerous for those with more experience and authority. I'll give you an example. So there's a study comparing doctors. So doctors who are senior experienced over a decade out of medical school, and then doctors who are junior, just coming out of medical school. They were given a case study to analyze, evaluate, and prescribe a course of treatment. Now they got the case study and the prescription of the course of treatment right at about the same rate. But the senior doctors were much more confident about their prescription and less likely to order additional tests and change their mind. And it's understandable why senior doctors would get it right the same, would get it right. They have a lot of experience know how. Junior doctors have fresher knowledge from medical school, but the ones with more experience and authority made more mistakes given their overconfidence and in an unwillingness to do additional evaluation. So this overconfidence bias can be a really serious issue when we're dealing with other people and thinking about our relationships with them. So most decisions we need to understand come from our emotions. Overconfidence has to do with how we feel. So that's a feeling of overconfidence, being way too confident and jumping to conclusions too quickly based on insufficient information. And we tend to really underestimate how important our emotions are in the decisions we make. So studies show that emotions drive 80 to 90% of our decision making. It's huge. And we don't realize it. When we do what comes naturally to us, we are overwhelmingly emotional creatures if we don't use evidence-based decision-making strategies. And the large majority of us, unfortunately, don't use these strategies in the vast majority of situations. Just we follow our intuitions, just like we follow our intuitions on our driving and being too confident about our driving. No wonder that 50,000 people a year get die in car accidents. So this is pretty dangerous, in, whether it's in driving or in our relationships to others. And you as HR professionals, you, of course, are in the business of relating to others and managing people's relationships, not simply to you, but within your company. You are in the people business. You are in the relationship business. And think about what happens when others are overconfident in their relationships. They feel that they know what, how other people are going to react. Managers think they know how their employees are going to react. And then they make a decision and they're overconfident. They don't get enough information about what the situation is. Employees also feel overconfident. And there's going to be a lot of conflicts, tensions, and misunderstandings as a result of it. So this overconfidence bias can be really dangerous. And that's a serious problem. More broadly, the problem is that we tend to follow our intuitions, trust our heart, go with our gut. That's what gurus tell us. And this, like Tony Robbins, he tells us to be primal, be savage. That's a, quite a problem you know, because trusting your gut feels comfortable. It feels comfortable, right, to trust your intuitions, to follow your heart, to be primal, to be savage. But it can often lead to disastrous decisions to be primal, to be savage. That's the very opposite of diversity, equity, inclusion. You know, we wouldn't need the board chair for diversity, equity, inclusion as part of a sherm if we just were following our intuitions and everything was hunky-dory, everything turned out right. We should not follow our intuitions. Otherwise, again, we would not need diversity, equity, and inclusion. We would be just doing the right thing all the time. So this is really dangerous, that we're taught to follow our intuition, to go to be primal, to be savage. Instead, we need to learn to be civilized, learn new, better habits, how to act and how to be. Because our gut is evolved for the ancient savannah not the modern world. That's really critical to understand. We are evolved for living in small tribes of 50 people to 150 people. And we are evolved for a time when we had to live in a tribal society. It was very important to be loyal to our own tribe because if we weren't sufficiently loyal, your tribe would kick you out and you'd die. And so it was also at the same time important to be hostile to other tribes or another tribe would take over our tribe and we'd die as well. 
And guess what? We're the descendants of those who didn't die. So this is critical to understand that our intuitions are to be strongly tribal, to be like and to like and to be loyal to those who look like us, share values, share predispositions, those who are part of our tribe, and to be hostile to those who are not. That's our natural intuitions. Again, we need when we're thinking about diversity, equity, inclusion, when we're thinking about the addressing these blind spots and having better relationships then we are going against our intuitions. And that's hard to do, and you need to learn to do that. And the first step comes from not trusting your intuitions, because your intuitions will often cause you to make bad decisions. Another tendency here, that's the tribal one, is the fight or flight response to threats. It was life-saving for hunter gatherers where the risks were immediate, intense in the moment, like saber-toothed tigers. It was more important in that period of time to jump at a hundred shadows than to miss one saber to tiger. That's not what the reality is today. Today, in today's world, this tendency is quite dangerous because the risks we face are long-term, uncertain. They might come from notifications on our smartphone that keep us awake at night and stressed out and undermine our health and lead to burnout. So this is where risks might come in today's world. And this fight or flight response is where the overconfidence bias comes in. In the savant environment, it was very beneficial for us to make conclusions quickly, to jump to conclusions, to be overconfident, to not gather enough information before making decisions, because otherwise the saber-toothed tiger would eat us. In the modern world, that's a really bad idea. We have much more, we have many fewer saber-toothed tigers. We have much more time to make decisions, but we tend not to do that. We tend to be overconfident and jump to conclusions too quickly. And that results in a dangerous judgment errors, which are called cognitive biases that come from our evolutionary background and how our brains are wired. So the overconfidence bias is one of these dangerous judgment errors. And there are many others, and I'll talk about several of them. But you need to realize that we have systemic patterns where our mind is miswired and it goes awry and causes us to make some pretty bad decisions. And so at this stage, I want to ask you, did you ever make a bad decision? And then looking back, you realize you really had the information you needed to make a better decision? Go ahead and vote. Did you ever make a bad decision? But when you look back at it, you realize, yes, I had the information I needed to make a better decision. Five more seconds to make your voice heard. Yeah, so we very clearly see that everyone had their experience. Good, then you understand what it feels like to fall into a cognitive bias. So most likely your bad decision, if you had the right information, then you should have made the right decision if you're a rational creature, but we're not. We fall into these dangerous judgment errors, cognitive biases all the time. And so that's very important for us to know, to realize, and to be humble about our decision making. Let's talk about, go on and talk about something that many of you might have wondered when I started speaking. Not when you first saw me, but when I started speaking, because I obviously have an accent. Lots of people want to know where I'm from. I'll be happy to tell you. So my dad is Ukrainian and my mom is Moldovan. So Ukraine, unfortunately, is well known these days, and Moldova is a country to the southwest of Ukraine. So you could see it on the map. It's that little tiny green country. You need, it's so small, you need an arrow to point to it for people to be able to see it. And so this, my dad met my mom, they moved to Moldova, and I was born in 1981. And in 1991, when I was 10 years old, my parents moved to the United States and they grew up in New York City. So New York City is a cultural melting pot. You go a block, you hear a dozen different accents. And my parents taught me to be proud of my cultural heritage. So I chose not to give up my accent. Now, if I moved to a, the place where I live like right now, Columbus, Ohio, or if I moved to Anchorage or Fairbanks, anywhere in Alaska or anywhere in Ohio, 
I would have probably tried to you know, work on my accent and adopt more of a mainstream American accent because I wouldn't fit in. But in New York City, I fit in fine. And later, when I moved out of New York City, when I lived in North Carolina, when I was getting my PhD at UNC Chapel Hill, I learned that that was kind of a dumb decision because of tendency called accent discrimination. Accent discrimination. It's a false perception of those with foreign accents being less trustworthy less trustworthy. So that's a false perception, of course, but that's how people tend to feel, that those with foreign accents are less trustworthy. It's a stereotype, it's a bias. And there's only one foreign accent to which this doesn't apply, the British accent, that kind of they, they still have that cultural imperialism going for them. Now, there are two cognitive biases here that are really relevant, called the halo effect and the horns effect. So the horns effect has to do with somebody having little horns. If you dislike one characteristic of someone because it's different, usually because it's different than you, than your characteristics like accent, color, appearance, value set, religion, whatever, then you'll tend to have, then you'll tend to have two negative view of their other characteristic. And the halo effect is the opposite. It's kind of like someone has a little halo on their head. If you like one characteristic because it's similar to you, and different from, than some other people around you, then you'll have two positive view of their other characteristics. If you both, let's say, are from Fairbanks and then you meet in Alaska and then you meet in Dallas and you recognize each other's accents and how you behave, then you'll tend to be very positively predisposed toward each other and tend to trust each other too much, as an example. It's especially dangerous for all sorts of business relationships. Within companies, it happens all the time. So there are going to be conflicts between departments, like say sales and operations will have lots of conflicts. They'll have halo effects. So sales will have halo effects toward other people in sales. Operations will have halo effects toward other people in operations, but they'll have horns effects toward each other and they'll have a lot of conflicts between each other. So that, that's something I frequently see. And, Sometimes marketing and sales, where there's arguments between, is this a good lead? Is this a bad lead? And then you'll definitely have conflicts between legal and pretty much everyone else in the company. So there's going to be trouble within companies, but of course, externally too, when you're deciding on who to hire and who to promote. So let's give an example of this. I'm going to share my screen. And the context for this is that I'm presenting at Krakow, which is the Sherm Group for Central Ohio. If you know anything about Central Ohio, Columbus, where I live, you know it's the home of the Ohio State Buckeyes. It's the college football team doing pretty well this year. We're ranked number three, number four in college football. And our big rival is the University of Michigan Wolverines, which is ranked number two. And they beat us last year, so hopefully we'll get them this year. Hopefully so. And so this is the biggest rivalry in college football, probably the biggest, one of the biggest, if not the biggest rivalries in college football. So there's over 100 people in the room. This is the closing, I'm doing the closing keynote of the Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Conference. And I'm going to ask the people in the room whether they will hire a University of Michigan fan. So again, Central Ohio, I'm going to ask them. And these are H, lots of HR leaders, over 100 people from large companies like Nationwide and so on, as well as medium-sized companies who are coming to this closing keynote and diversity, equity, inclusion because they're passionate about the topic. So let's see whether they will hire a University of Michigan fan. So as you know, I'm a professor at Ohio State. I'm contractually obligated to root for the Buckeyes. <laughs> I'm guessing there are a lot of Buckeyes fans here, you know. Go Bucks, right? Yo, oh, there you go. Now, how likely are you to hire a Michigan fan? See, free people. Now, regardless of how we feel about Michigan fans and their poor, poor choices <laughs> in which team to root for, does that indicate anything about their performance as an employee? No, I know. Come on, that no should be stronger. <laughs> So, as you see, over 100 people in the room, and only three people would be willing to hire a University of Michigan fan. And it's not just their initial impulse. I gave them a chance to change their mind. 
and they weren't willing to change their mind. So this is a very powerful tendency, the halo effect and the horns effect, the halo effect and the horns effect. And it's something that you really need to be aware of and think about how it might be impacting your company, how it might be impacting your team. So now I'm going to ask you, how valuable do you think it will be for you and your team to address this halo effect and the horns effect? Please go ahead and vote. Okay, most of us voted. Five more seconds. Make your voice heard. Okay, so we see that the vast majority of you would find it highly valuable, and so over so something like sixty percent. And 30% will find moderately valuable and 10% not valuable. So yes, very valuable. Clearly, this is really important. So great. Now you can take this information and bring it back to your teams. Excellent. And so these are the halo effect and the horns effect are an example of tribalism. And there's many other LM cognitive biases associated with tribalism. The overconfidence bias is an example of the fight or flight response. And there are many other cognitive biases associated with the fight or flight response. But how do we figure out which of these are going to be the most powerful and prevalent in the companies where we work? So thinking about you as an HR professional, how do you figure that out? A really good tool is the assessment on dangerous judgment errors in the workplace. It focuses on the 30 most dangerous cognitive biases in professional settings. It evaluates their extent and impact in your workplace and provides next steps for addressing them. So let me share with you what this assessment looks like. You should be able to see it now. And open up the chat because we'll be using it. So the assessment evaluates the quality of decision-making and helps you develop an organizational culture of decision-making excellence. So this is addressing blind spots, helping you with the relationships. Now, each question refers to a problem that might occur in everyday professional situations you want to indicate how often it occurred in the past year. The answer for each question will be in percentage terms out of all possible times the problem might have occurred. So don't really overthink it. Go with your initial impression. It doesn't have to be precise. So focus on your immediate, so what you're most familiar with. Organizational department, team, or group. Apply your evaluation to that unit. If you have a view of the whole organization, you can apply to the whole organization. So what we'll do is We'll go through it and we'll just take a look at a couple of questions and give a couple of answers. And you'll put your answers into the chat. So think about the number of projects that missed a deadline or went over budget in the past year. So number question number one, put in the chat, what percentage of projects missed the deadline or went over budget in the last year? Please go ahead. So 60%, 30%, 40%, Twenty percent, fifteen percent, zero percent, forty-five percent, twenty, thirty, another sixty. Other folks, your estimates. Please go ahead, put them in the chat. Karen is not sure. Twenty percent, thirty percent, good. So what you'll send, see is that it does range highly from zero to sixty percent. If it's in the you know, zero to five to ten percent range, it's not too big of a deal. It's variance; it happens. If it's in the fifteen to twenty percent, it's a more serious issue. If it's twenty or above, that's that becomes a quite serious issue. So this is because you're misdirecting resources and making bad mistakes, making mistakes on your investments. So this has to do with a cognitive bias known as the planning fallacy. So we tend to feel that everything will go according to plan when we make a plan. In fact, there's a phrase that failing to plan is planning to fail. 
and it implies that when you make a plan, everything will go well. Unfortunately, that's not the reality. Often plans don't actually result in the outcomes that we want. So a much better phrase is failing to plan for problems is planning to fail. Failing to plan for problems is planning to fail. And this is the planning fallacy. Let's do this one, number two. Now thinking about conflicts that occurred, why did they occur? Of all team conflicts that occurred because, of all team conflicts that occurred because someone overestimated the effectiveness of their communication skills and persuasiveness. So thinking about the conflicts that occurred. Okay, so Moija says 100%. Mm -hmm. Ninety percent, ninety percent, seventy-five percent, fifty percent, seventy-five percent, eighty-five, eighty, twenty-five percent, seventy-five percent, fifty percent. So a lot. So really quite high, higher than the previous one, definitely. So this has to do with the illusion of transparency. When we communicate, we tend to feel that others get. 100% of our message and agree with 100% of our message. That's how it intuitively feels. That's how the world should work. That's how it feels to us. And we don't realize that, hey, some people may mishear us. So the, whether we're communicating on Zoom or face-to-face, -face, people may not hear us correctly. Some people may misunderstand us. They might hear us, but they might have different interpretations of terms, or they might have different context, and they may misunderstand the term that we're using. Or they may hear us and understand us, but they might not agree with us. So they might disagree with us, but not show. They might not acknowledge that their disagreement because of power dynamics or because they're conflict avoidant. And so this is a big, big problem that results in a lot of team conflicts. And I see them happen all the time. And let's go with number six. When a potential current employee was evaluated, in what percentage of the cases was the evaluation too positive due to factors not relevant to job competency or organizational fit? So too positive of an evaluation. Please go ahead. 30 percent, 50 percent, 30 percent, 90 percent, 80, 40, 25 percent, 20 percent, 50 percent. So yes, yeah, so this of course has to do with the halo effect. And this is we over evaluate people because of reasons that are not appropriate. And so there are going to be 27 more questions like this. So this is a really useful tool and very helpful for identifying these cognitive biases and their role within your company, within your organization. And let's see how you feel, how valuable it would be for you and your team to take this assessment and address the cognitive biases that it uncovers. Please go ahead and vote. About half of us participated. Let's give the others five more seconds. Make your voice heard. Okay, so this time everyone found either moderately or highly valuable. That's excellent, it's just about half and half. So that's excellent. So then take it to your teams, take it yourself, take it to your teams and I'll send you a copy of it after the presentation. Great. Now, once you learn about these tool, these topics, these cognitive biases, so the assessment will really help you learn about them. In the conclusion to the assessment, it tells you about all the cognitive biases associated with each behavior and how to address them. So you'll see, you saw from the questions that you don't need to know anything about cognitive biases to take them, which is one of the benefits of the assessment. You just can take it easily and have everyone take it. So this is very useful in that regard. Now, another tool that I want to share with you about is five questions to avoid decision disasters. This will help you address the problems. So if you want to actually address the problems, not simply be aware of them, awareness is the first step, but how do you catch these problems? Well, this is a checklist of questions that helps you address these cognitive biases so that you can make better decisions about people and your relationships to them. Let's talk about these questions. What important information didn't I yet fully consider? So what evidence did you take into account? 
the first thing to think about is what we don't fully consider. We don't fully consider information that goes against our intuitions, that goes against our beliefs. So that's really important to think about. Try to, instead of trying to look for evidence that supports your beliefs, look for information that disconfirms your beliefs. So don't try to prove yourself right, try to prove yourself wrong. And if you can't prove yourself wrong, great, then you're more likely to be right. But if you can't prove yourself wrong, great, then you're not gonna screw up a decision. Also, make sure to look for information that's important. Don't fall into analysis paralysis. That's another component of the question. So think about what information is important and look for that information. What dangerous judgment errors didn't I yet address? So if you're dealing with people, it might be the halo effect or the horns effect. If you're dealing with gathering information, it might be the overconfidence bias. If you're making planning a project, it might be the planning fallacy. Once you take the assessment and you'll know about these, it will be quite helpful for you to just bring them into mind. What would a trust and objective advisor suggest I do? So maybe a fellow member of a Sherm who you trust, maybe a mentor, a coach, consultant, what would they suggest you do in this situation? Now we're moving on from the first three, which are about making the decision to implementing it. How have I addressed all the ways this could fail? So think about the decision, whatever it might be. Think about what, how these sorts of decisions failed in other contexts, whether for you or for others, and how can these problems be addressed in advance? And finally, what new information would cause me to revisit this decision? What would cause you to change your mind about the situation? We tend to be stuck after we make a decision, and it's very hard for us to change our mind unless we decide in advance that, hey, there's going to be certain trigger points that cause me to reevaluate the decision. So let's talk about work through a typical activity that HR professionals do. You're making a new hire. So what important information didn't I yet fully consider? One of the big problems I see in companies is failing to consider references. Many companies think and feel that, hey, this person gave us references, therefore they're all going to say nice things about him or her, then we don't need to call them. Big mistake. References will often tell you information that you may be surprised to hear. For example, you may ask them, what kind of culture do you think this person would succeed in? And many companies have different cultures. You don't tell them your culture in advance. And this person might describe a culture that's very different from your own. Or you might look at link, uh, LinkedIn and see if you have any connections with a person who you're thinking about hiring and ask them about this person. So a reference that the person didn't give you. Second, what dangerous judgment errors didn't I yet address? So for example, if you have some similarities to this person that are going to predispose you to him or her, then maybe you want to be a little bit suspicious of your predisposition toward this person, the halo effect. What would a trust and objective advisor suggest I do? So think about someone who has a different personality than you do. What would they suggest you do in this situation? Someone maybe who would place themselves in the bottom half of all drivers, if you tend to place yourself in the top half, or vice versa. Someone who is less confident or more confident. Think about people with different personalities and takes and what would they say? How have I addressed the ways this could fail? So how does someone fail when they start a new job? Maybe they are not getting sufficient mentoring. So maybe you make sure to assign this person a mentor when they come into your organization and a peer as well. So a buddy system, which is someone who would be a peer a couple of years out, but also a more senior mentor, someone who is 15 or 20 years in the company and who can really give them sponsorship and mentorship as they make their way into the company. And what new information would cause me to revisit this decision? So you might set a timeline of 30, 60, and 90 days to do a 360 degree review and see, well, is this person working out or not? And then make a decision on whether you want to keep this person or not based on those reviews because you want to fail fast if you need to fail. But also those reviews will give you a chance to, if the person is potentially going to work out but just needs some course correction, you can course correct this person at those stages. So that's a way that you would use this for hiring. And this is an excellent technique to use not only with individual decision-making, but with group decision-making. So if you're making a decision as a group, you want to have everyone answer these questions in advance of the decision-making meeting and write down their answers. This is incredibly helpful because then you won't be anchored by each other's answers and will give your more introverted, pessimistic, 
people a chance to process the information, get their answers out. And you start the meeting by just everyone reading their answer to number one. And then you discuss it, come to consensus, then read their answer to number two, to three, to four, to five. The decision-making meeting goes much, much faster than a typical decision-making meeting, and you're much more likely to make the right decision. Now, thinking about this technique, how valuable do you think this technique would be for you and your team to use in making good enough decisions? Okay, give five more seconds, make your voice heard. Okay, I think this proved to be, I think the most popular one so far and everybody would find it valuable. And this is a little bit even more valuable than the assessment. Great, I'm glad to hear it. I have a question. <clears throat> Well, well, we're gonna we're finishing up, and we'll get to the questions in just a bit. Okay. Okay. So, key takeaways: tribalism. It causes us to favor those in our in group without realizing. It. So, you really don't want to trust your gut on people decisions if you don't want to screw up. Use the assessment to learn about and address cognitive biases, and use the five questions to make good enough people decisions quickly and effectively. All right, everyone. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation, and I'll be happy to take your question. So please go ahead, May, you can ask your question now. Can you go back one slide? Because it was a part Yeah. Okay, well, first of all, thank you for the wonderful presentation. You're very welcome. Okay, so when I am making a decision or when mm -hmm. I'm comfortable making a big decision and my mind is like, this is the way I'm gonna go. Yeah. And I ask question number one or two, and mm -hmm. then three, four, and five, Yep. I notice it's my husband who challenges me mm -hmm. and says things like, have you thought up everything? And what if it is and when I get uncomfortable because those are very mm -hmm. valid questions and I need mm -hmm. to think through and mm -hmm. I've made up my decision because I'm looking at it one certain way, right? Mm -hmm. yep. So how do you challenge yourself to have a more open mind and not just this one way of thinking is right, but to really mm -hmm. step back holistically and say, okay, five questions here without mm -hmm. any bias of this mm -hmm. is how I want to resolve it and let me justify. So a lot of time we just justify mm -hmm. why we want to do yeah. this without thinking it through. Can you talk yeah. to that a little? Of course, May. And this is the whole point of the previous part of the presentation about why you should be using this. <laughs> so in order to convince yourself to use this, you have to just learn and accept that we are flawed beings. We're not rational, we're not perfect. We, all of us answered yes to saying that we had all the information we needed to make a decision and we made a bad decision. Why does that happen? If we have all the information we need to make a good decision, we, we should be making the good decision, right? Like that's the rational thing to do, but we don't. That's not the, how we are structured. So we need to understand that we are flawed, that we have these cognitive biases, and it's just a, the structure of the human mind. It's our intuitions, which are just not evolved for the modern world. You know, we're connecting right now on a Zoom screen. We're not wired for that. We are wired to be live in those small tribes in the savannah environment. And because our mind is not wired for that, we need to use certain techniques that are going to help us make better decisions in today's environment. And these questions are going to help us make better decisions. So it comes from acknowledging that we can't simply trust ourselves. But we, when we make up our mind, we are very likely being overconfident. And that overconfidence bias is very dangerous and causes us to make a lot of bad decisions. And so these five questions help address not only the overconfidence bias, but a lot of these other cognitive biases that we talked about. So you need to be feel and accept that we are flawed. You need to feel and accept that in order to address these flaws, we need to ask these sorts of questions of ourselves and really challenge ourselves and not trust ourselves because trusting ourselves is what gets us into this mess in the first place. <laughs> Other folks, you can ask, you can unmute yourself or type your questions into the chat, whatever you prefer.
nothing. I'll give it a few minutes, but I was just thinking about overconfidence. I've never thought about it that way. And I haven't learned that in uh, the majority of the trainings that um, on this topic that I have uh, attended. So this was new. Thank you. It's very new. Well. Yeah. I just remember reading Blink in college. Uh, mm -hmm. Um, and it's almost the exact opposite, right? Like it's normally like yeah. that, that decision that comes to your mind is, you know, normally the, the one you need to, to use, but, um, but yeah, this is definitely a totally different way of looking at it. Well, okay. if, if Blink was right, then why would we need diversity, equity, inclusion, right? Like that's sure. the whole point. Blink is a very flawed mentality. It's great yeah. for when you want to catch a baseball in the blink of an eye, like that's fine. It's good for those intuitive, quick decisions that you need to make when you are dealing with life or death situations. So Malcolm Gladwell is right on for that. But his, if Blink was right, then it would just take away the whole need for diversity, equity, inclusion for all of these sorts of things, because we would just be rational robots and we'd be making the right decisions all the time, which we're completely not. Yep. Uh, OK, Carrie had a question. Uh, please go ahead. Okay, so in the chat, she asks, how do you go about using 30 question assessment in an organization? Best way to preface it. Do you do within small teams or org wide? Definitely start within a small team. So you want to get buy-in. So starting within a small team, within the leadership team, if you have access to that, ideally, or within HR to get buy-in and then getting it to the leadership team. Uh, so that would be the way I would, uh, the way I've seen it be used well. So get people first of all to have that as idea to have that support, and then expand it outward. Christopher, yes, the book includes the assessment. Mm -hmm. All right, any other questions? I didn't get the book, uh, so you can go to, I'll put the, I'll put the link to the book into the chat. Hmm? Awesome, well, thank you so much, Dr. Gleb. It was a pleasure learning thank from you. you today. And to all, on behalf of all our members, thank you again. And uh, we'll see you all hopefully on October 12th at the Petroleum Club. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. You have a great day. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.